Sutton York, the University of Huddersfield's first women in sustainability event. Um, I'm fortunate to share the virtual platform this lunchtime with four amazing women who've all succeeded in contributing to the creation of a more sustainable society. Um, but before we begin, I wanted to talk a little bit about the format of this event. So for the first half, I'll be talking to our, each of our panelists in turn as they share their personal career story in relation to sustainability. And we're then going to come together as a group and the second half is really over to you. So please put any questions that you have in the Q&A function. You can find it at the bottom of the Zoom um, screen and um, I'll try and raise as many questions as we have time for with, a, with our panelists. Um, you can submit questions throughout the event. So if you've got something burning you want to ask now, by all means, pop it in there. Um, I just ask that if you're a student, if you could just pop that at the end of your questions so we know we've got a mix of, of um, participants um, in the audience. Um, I want to start by saying a little bit more about the background of the event. The inspiration for it was really the recognition that as 50% of people on the planet, women have a crucial role to play in the creation of a more sustainable and equitable low carbon society. So what we, what we feel that is to, to really harness women's energy and ideas, we need to collectively recognize and address some of the issues that still hold women back today. And I think this last year has really demonstrated the critical role that women leaders have played um, in responding to COVID-19 in particular. So from Taiwan's PM um, Tsai Ing-wen and New Zealand's Jacinda Ardern, to Kate Bingham, the chair of the UK Vaccine Task Force, and also Professor Sarah Gilbert, the main mover behind the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So we know what women are capable of, but we still face a world in which girls are less likely to go to school than boys, women are still disproportionately suffer from sexual violence and abuse, and are still not fully represented in the boardroom or positions of power. So what we wanted to do today was provide an opportunity here from four women who um, carved out careers in pursuit of a more sustainable and equitable society. And we know that more equitable societies are more sustainable ones, both environmentally and socially and economically. But what does it mean to be a woman working in sustainability? And how do you go about developing a career that contributes to it? So before I introduce the first of our panelists, uh, panelists, Professor Adele Jones, I just wanted to share a bit more about my personal sustainability story. Um, you'll have seen from my biography that I'm currently director of fundraising for UK for UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency's national partner here in the UK. And we help refugees by advocating for their protection and raising funds that help UNHCR protect people fleeing conflict and persecution across the globe. My job is focused on managing a team to raise funds in the UK to support the organisation in that work and also to build kind of solidarity and raise awareness of refugee crises amongst our supporters. And climate change is exacerbating the situation for us as an organisation too. It disproportionately affects the world's most vulnerable, including forcibly displaced and stateless people. Um, it's pushing people to flee to areas where they're more likely to come into conflict with others. Um, and research shows that over 200 million people, double the current numbers, could need humanitarian assistance by 2050 without ambitious climate action. So as an organisation, both UNHCR here in the UK and also internationally, we also recognise that we need to kind of overhaul our own infrastructure and ways of working. So it's not just dealing with um, kind of refugees and people forced to flee and increased numbers of that as a result of the climate crisis, but also making sure that um, in terms of the way that we work as organisations, that we're, we're making um, our organisations as carbon neutral and as sustainable as possible. UNHCR has got the biggest footprint of all the UN agencies. and We run refugee camps in many countries and we're looking at how we can make those run on a more sustainable basis at the moment. And that might come from um, uh, putting sort of panels in place to generate energy, to the way that we use water in those facilities and also kind of tree planting. My route to this role started way back at university. Um, and as a geographer, um, I don't know if you, you're aware of this, but, but geographers have a reputation for being a jack of all trades and a master of none. And um, for me, I think there are some huge benefits to that. I think, um, gives one the ability to make connections between things, to understanding the relationship between people and planet, 
And it's a great grounding when it comes to sustainability and joining the dots in what is today's very complex and interconnected world. I took a year out halfway through my undergraduate degree to go traveling with my then boyfriend. And I spent three months in Sudan in the mid eighties before cycling back to the UK via Egypt and Western Europe. In Sudan, I spent some time following a PhD written 20 years previously, which was looking at the impact of mechanized crop production in the Qadarif region. And that experience for me sparked a lifelong love of Africa and an interest in environmental and social issues. Um, I knew when I graduated that I wanted to do a day job that um, reflected my own values and interests and for want of a better word kind of put something back. So um, when it came to graduating I, I got the first job I could which happened to be a kind of low paid tech job at a London stockbrokers where I was doing a lot of photocopying and printing out valuations. Um, but after a few months the people who managed the place they kind of suddenly realised that I had a degree and they offered me um, a graduate traineeship with them. I actually turned it down. Um, I'd have been a really, really bad stockbroker and I just really wasn't interested. Uh, it turned out to be a rather wise move actually, despite my mother's disappointment. I think she would have quite liked to have a daughter as a stockbroker. Um, because four weeks after they made that offer to me, Black Monday happened and I'd have just been out of my ear anyway. So I stuck to my guns and I held out for a job with an organization I could identify with. And I ended up getting a fundraising traineeship at NSPCC, the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. So with my foot in the charity door, as it were, I was kind of able to build on this experience and to begin to carve out a career working for causes that move me, the majority of which has involved working in the arena of international development and humanitarian response, such as UNICEF, UN Children's Fund, um, MAG, the Manchester-based Minds Action Group that campaigns for and removes landmines and unexploded ordnance. And now the UK arm of the um, UN Refugee Agency. But I didn't do it alone. Um, there were many um, inspirational, supportive women and men along the way. So from my first boss, Giles Pegram at NSPCC, to my bunch of close girlfriends, many of whom I met working at UNICEF in the 1990s, and who still provide me with kind of advice and support on work issues to also kind of colleagues such as Dr. Julia Meaton, Professor Adrian Woods, Dr. Walter Mazwacker and Matt Snell from my time at Huddersfield working for the Sustainable and Resilient Communities Group, all of whom helped me to navigate academia, which was very new to me when I joined Huddersfield University in 2014. Um, and I have to add to that list because I can't forget the kind of number of inspiring men and women I've met during my, my work. So when my time at Huddersfield, I was working on the uh, uh, research project in Southwest Ethiopia. So people like Senadu Malese, member of the Contour Bahan Forest um, Coffee Co-op, who as a widow with four children was, um, she had about nine different money-making uh, enterprises, including brewing beer, harvesting coffee and fattening sheep. Um, and was an um, incredible role model for other local women in terms of encouraging them to kind of join in the, uh, the co-op that um, the project was um, being partly involved in um, setting up with local people. So that's, that's a bit about my sustainability story, but I'd now like to introduce you to a number of other um, individuals who hopefully are gonna help inspire you in, in your careers. Um, and the first of our four panelists um, is um, Professor Adele Jones. Adele's been Professor of Social Work at Huddersfield since 2007, and she's Director of the Non-In-3 Centre for the Global Prevention of Gender-Based Violence. With a background as a social worker, she joined academia in 1995 and specialises in children's rights and the prevention of violence against women and children. So Adele, thank you for joining us today. Um, I know you're speaking to us from overseas, um, so hopefully we'll keep the connection. But I just wondered if you could start by telling us a bit about yourself and the path that you took, uh, that took you into the work that you're currently doing at the moment. Thank you very much, Fiona. And um, it's, it's great to be here with everybody. And, and thanks to the listeners for joining in. I hope you will have lots of questions for us. So, so how, how do I come to be here? I guess, how do I come to be on a panel like this? Well, I never, I never planned my journey at all. I, uh, I, I, I think I was born to be a social worker. Um, I, somebody met me the other day and they said, if you had a, 
a wand and a tiara, you would still think you could change the world. And it and it's absolutely true. And I guess that does that sum up social work, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, I, I think that's was was what I was gifted to do. And I worked as a practicing social worker for, for a great, great many years. Uh, I worked for Rochdale, for Salford, for Manchester, um, and I always worked with children and families. I entered a, a academia, I'm not quite sure why, um, but I've never kind of looked back. It, it seemed to me to make sense that from moving to practice, one should think about teaching, and then once I was in the role of teaching, I always thought I was a reasonable social worker. I thought maybe I could be a reasonable teacher, but I should then uh, begin to think about research. And, I, and that has taken me down this path. What I do, I, I obviously, I, I run a center, I created a center for the prevention of global uh, gender-based violence. And um, Gender-based violence is not something that all people automatically think of when they think of sustainability. Uh, but actually, the work we do, the work I do, ties directly in to the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we completely tie in with about five of them. Um, and my personal path to getting here, well, I grew up with a, I grew up with a father who's very violent, a very abusive father with a lot of domestic violence in my household and I remember um, I remember thinking when he was out of control not that one has to be out of control to be violent in fact often violence is very controlled very deliberate but but there were times when he was simply enraged that I could I remember thinking as a child there's no way to stop this there's no way to put a cap on it there's no way that he could be stopped at that point. Now, I know how crucial it is to have good laws, to have good policies, to have good treatments. I appreciate all of that. Um, but I mean, there was a time my father was actually in prison. Uh, he had public declarations here, and you'd think I was on the Oprah Winfrey show, wouldn't you? But there was a time when my father was in prison uh, for, for, for a sexual assault of a young girl and, and he went on a, a treatment program. And I was, even then as an adult, and he had gone on this program, I knew that if he wanted to continue his behavior, he would. And I, the question that was in my mind was, how do you ever stop somebody being violent when being violent is what they know, what they do well, what they can get away with? And I thought, you know, the only way really really truly in terms of sustaining change is to start at the early stage what was it about my dad wasn't born an abuser what was it about his childhood experiences what was it about what made him a man that thought this was ever going to be okay what was it and what could I do to start thinking about changing the minds the attitudes the norms the values uh, that people subscribe to that fuel violence against women and children now i'm not saying there's always that, that one should always be looking for causes but i do believe that preventing violence in the long term that sustainable action on preventing violence actually requires more dedicated focus on prevention so i applaud all of the people that are working in all the different areas of gender-based violence but the work that I lead is all about trying to prevent it in the long term. So we try to focus on it now, in the here and now, because trust me, if you're in a situation of violence here and now, it's safety that you need first and foremost, and, and, you, need, and you need justice. But in the long term, you need to know that your children are not going to be exposed to violence, that the son that you've brought up that was exposed to his father being violent is not going to go on to being violent you need to know that your daughter is not going to become victimized so I think for the long term you need to feel comfortable that the world you live in is changing and becoming a less accepting place for violence so I came into the work that I do uh, professionally through being a social worker and personally through growing up with violence so that's why I'm where I am at this point. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that with us. And um, I mean, it, it sounds like you're, you know, obviously you've had that very strong personal motivation as well as a kind of that professional interest. Um, and 
in terms of where you've got to today, what, what would you see as the kind of greatest achievement in your career so far? I think personally, I would say it was doing a PhD. I, I mean, I didn't, I came from a family in the end, we, we were very much a single parent family, where going to university wasn't even an option option it wasn't even on the cards you left school at 16 and you had to go and help to put money into the family pot so for me to end up doing a PhD was something that has been I I'm, I know I'm still an inspiration to my family I'm the only one who and lots of us are around who've come from families where this was not expected um, so you, I know that that was really important on a personal level it was probably the biggest single thing I ever did for me as a social worker you spend your whole life doing for others or with others or supporting people but this was something it was my learning it was my education and what I would say about doing a PhD it kind of opened my eyes to things that well it opened my eyes to research it opened my eyes to, 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 to the beauty of research, to the messiness of research, to the fun of research, to its scariness, to how valuable it can actually be uh, in practice. It opened my eyes to lots of things. So the PhD was very crucial. In terms of what I do at Huddersfield, uh, I mean, I'm very, very proud of the fact that as an academic, I've generated about more than eight million pounds in external grant funding for research on uh, violence against women and children. I'm really proud of that. I think that that isn't, none of that is easy. People say, oh, you're good at fundraising. You're, a, you know this, this is what you do. This is, there's nothing easy about this. It's, it is really kind of torturous and it's got, it's got harder and harder as the sources of funding have become more competitive and, and reduced. So I'm really proud that I've generated a lot of money and what that money is, I'm, I'm even more proud of what we've done with the money. So we established this center and we are called none in three because, well, I think a lot of people will know that one in three women and girls are, are going to face sexual or physical violence in their lifetime. And we cannot think of a, a better statistic than none in three. And so what, what we do, we're working at the moment in eight countries. Um, we're working in Uganda, where one of the other panelists is. We're working in, in India, in Jamaica, Barbados, Grenada, St. Lucia. We were also working in the UK and we started a new project in Brazil. And we everything that we do is around around prevention. So I, I guess I'm incredibly proud of setting up this, this global center, which has just literally the best people in the world, in all of our countries working with us, dedicated men and women who are just doing some just awe-inspiring work on the ground. So I'm, I'm really proud of what, of what I've done. That's quite an achievement, and I, I do recognise how hard it is to raise that money. And, and, it, and it sounds from the way you're talking there that it's, it's moving into academia has always also been a way of kind of making some of those issues more public, um, as well as just, you know, the oh. social work is, is dealing with the person on a, you know, one-on-one -on -one basis. It's really important, but the research has enabled you to kind of get into the public domain. And Absolutely. I was just wondering that move from being a practicing social worker to an academic was there was there anything that particularly prompted that shift and and does that early experience still inform your academic life what prompt I, I saw a job and it had my name on it I think that's always happened I you know hey I wasn't looking but there's a job I think it's time and um yeah, it had my name all over it and I, I applied for it. And my first academic job was working at Manchester Metropolitan University, which is also where I got my PhD. And I remember it being interviewed. I remember the head of department saying that you are going to be teaching students who are more qualified than you. And that, that was very true. Huh? That was really true. I didn't have, I don't have much academic credentials behind my name it was very true uh, but it was what spurred me on to get my PhD uh, so, but I but being a social worker has been crucial to my understanding and this is really quite important I in in the job that I do I work with a lot of academics that what they do is research and they're they're very gifted researchers but they sometimes 
too often lose sight of the person behind the research. They, it's, you know, and it happens especially with quantitative researchers, especially as you could imagine why, that they, that, that hang on, those 7,000 children that we've just surveyed in terms of their experiences of abuse in Jamaica, are their 7,000 individual children. And, you know, you, it's not just about getting your prestigious publications out. It's about looking at the harms that children are revealing and then thinking about the person. I have never lost sight of that. I have never lost the social worker in me. It's the way that I work with people. It's the, it's the way that I am a leader. I have never lost it. I told you I was born to it and I guess I'll die it. It's, it's, it's just in my blood and it has very much influenced the way that I work. I, I, I mean, I'm, I can be tough and I can be pretty nasty, I say it, but I can, but I'm, I, I, I really tend to fairness. I really t tend to inclusivity. I, I, not as words, but I really believe that it, it would be impossible to do this work on a global level without we having ha that people feel that they want to work in a center like ours. And they do, because we do work very differently. We are inclusive, we, we are fair, you know, and uh, nasty when we need to be. <laughs> yeah, those boundaries are important, aren't they? Um, you, you talked about being so proud of the work that you're doing and, and a lot of the people in the centre. And I was just wondering, who's inspired you during the course of your career and what have you learnt from them? In terms of my career, uh, who's inspired me? Um, who's inspired me in terms of... I would say... I was very inspired by Toni Morrison. I, not because she was an academic, as a, a Nobel laureate yeah. author, but I was I, when I started what I what I call my political reading, my political education, which was probably I mean I wasn't a very politicized black woman, which is a, almost like an oxymoron, isn't it? I wasn't, but um, but when I started my political reading, it was through the works of Toni Morrison, reading The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. She wrote that book about me. I was a black kid, a black mixed race girl growing up in a very racist society. And the bluest eye was, she wrote it about me. She didn't know that, but she did. And I, I, I kind of found, I found my way to understanding um, my identity through Toni Morrison. She was also, I, I don't think she ever said this, but I believe she was a radical feminist. And I loved the fact that her, the R in her radical was not raging. It was a reasoned radical. And I like that. Not that there isn't a place for rage. Trust me, rage is wonderful when yeah. it's used appropriately. There is a place, but she really inspired me. And, and most recently, Michaela Cole, the actress. Yes. I tell you, when I watched that woman on stage for the first time, I said to myself, I needed to have met her when I was a little girl. I needed to know that you could be like that, that you could be who you were and who you were could be many, many, many things and that you could be completely free and you could be both beautiful and you could be ugly and you could be dynamic and you could be quite, you could be nuanced. You could be, a, a, you could be all of it and be black and I love that she's quite a, a force isn't she I mean you know wow. actor director producer for those of you who haven't seen it I so recommend I I may destroy you her recent kind of BBC kind of kept me going through lockdown so uh, amongst many other things that she's done including yeah. children as well and could I just say that I guess that the person that I always think of who has inspired me a great deal is my son I have one child I have a son who is who was who has struggled he's struggled with so many issues and yet he's he's always been an inspiration to me and even when he was a little boy he was the one that really kind of explained to me what children's rights is all about you know because he has such a he was such a passion for justice and for you know no mom you're just assuming I'm the one that took that extra packet of biscuits out the fridge. Let's talk about this. I mean, he's, 
his capacity for justice um, was, was, was very evident from the very, very early days and for making you listen, for just making you say, just stop, just stop, mum, and just listen. And, I, and I, I really appreciated that. And he does that now, you know, when I'm ready to go on one. Just stop, mum, just stop, <laughs> just listen. Good lesson. That's great. Um, I think we're running out of time, Adele. That's been really, really lovely talking to you. And um, I know you're not going to go away and you're going to join us for the Q&A session. So please, if anybody out there has got any questions for Adele in particular, then please do um, submit them on the, on the Q&A button. Um, just picking up on your son's passion for justice, um, it's a kind of nice segue into the next of our panellists, who is... Um, Sarah is um, Sarah Agar Brennan. I hope I've said that properly, Sarah. Um, Sarah is a serial entrepreneur and since 2019, a business advisor at Huntersville University. Having started her first business age 20 and gone on to be involved in many, many more, she spends her time inspiring the next generation of um, women entrepreneurs. So Sarah, um, welcome to this event and lovely to meet you virtually. Um, like Adele, if, if I could start just by asking you um, a bit about yourself and the path that took you into the work that you're currently doing at the moment. I think my, um, it's interesting because my, when I first got asked to do this, I think my initial reaction was me, <laughs> really? <laughs> because I think I've always done my own thing and I've never really considered that to be um, flying the flag for sustainability because I've not been in a high powered job or done anything dramatic I've just done my thing um, and I guess really for me my journey um, started out when I was a child and it was instilled in me by my parents to be kind and to make a difference in the world whether that's to the planet or the people animals I was taught the value, value of equality and diversity from a very young age so after finishing university I naturally wanted to put that into practice and I, I took a look at what was going on and what the options were for me coming out of university in that last six months of my final year and really it, it didn't turn me on. I couldn't see myself doing that. I couldn't see how I would make a difference going into a graduate programme. Um, and so very quickly I, I, I made a big and bold decision that I was going to make my own way in the world. Um, I wanted to make a difference, whether that was in my local community, donating to charity, reducing inequality, the well-being of my team around me. I was always championing the values that I stood by. And it wasn't always easy to do that, especially, I mean, I was from the north of England, from Teesside, very industrial. Um, so growing up as an eco-friendly vegetarian child in the 80s, it took some balls, I'll tell you. Um, and I had to really stand, I had to really question myself so much. Is, is this what, who I am? Because if I was going to put that out into the world and I was going to stand by it, I needed to really understand who I was. So from a very early age, I think I had that emotional intelligence in place. And I, and I really did start to embark on that journey. Um, and then I spent the best part of 25 years running businesses. Um, and I've dedicated myself to that. I've always been drawn to like great ideas um, and ambitious people and and the, I can't resist the pull of what's possible. So fast forward to what I'm doing now and I'm sharing my experiences and enthusiasm with like-minded entrepreneurs who are brave enough to give it a go um, and, and that's here at the University of Huddersfield as part of the enterprise team. I think my business career has taken me along many paths because I myself have lots of ideas and I've over the years implemented those ideas with gusto and passion um, but I think what's always kept what's always stood firm with those values because they were embedded in me from the word go so I've always tried to run my business and honour those and that's honouring the people around me and the environment around me um, and, and working with local businesses where I can and encouraging um, that community to come together to, to, to make a difference. So I think my, my experience has been very much on the ground um, and I've wanted to 
yeah make a difference with absolutely everything that I've done every business that I've run I've been um, when my children were really young I had a quite a big business and then I scaled it back and I as they were getting older and kind of needing more time I went into community sport which was amazing and I think I really found myself for that like 10 year period because I was working in a lot of disadvantaged communities I was working in the skate community I was bringing skateboard programs coaching um, I was applying for a lot of funding to get grants to give those services to the areas that needed it I fundraised for numerous skate parks and projects um, and I helped people kind of make something of their life through the medium of skateboarding and extreme sports um, and I guess that really was a time in my life where I, you know the heart felt stuff I, I feel like I, feel I grew as a person that, and I really kind of found my um, yeah my calling I suppose but then the pull of business got me again and off I went and as the kids got older I went back into business um, but again, always keeping those values very close to my heart. Um, yeah, that's me really. <laughs> that's great, thank you. And I love the I love the skateboarding uh, reference. Um, I have to ask you: Were you a skate? Are you a skateboarder? Yeah. I was a skateboarder. <laughs> but I did. I did for a while. Anybody's listening who was from my past will go, "She was so bad." But I did what I. I the thing is, I came in. I was an I was an inline skater actually from probably when they first came out. So. Um, the quads that everybody's kind of on them again which is fantastic I grew up on those and then when inline skates came out I, I switched to them and then I probably spent the best part of 10 years 12 years on my inline skates so I'd go on to the like when my children were babies I'd be on the buggy pushing my buggy on my skates and then so it was kind of a natural progression onto skateboard but I was nowhere near as talented on a skateboard as I was on skates so it was a struggle for me so I do longboard and I still go out on it now but there's no talent there I'm afraid sorry to disappoint you all <laughs> no talent slight diversion from the subject to hand but um just just it's really interesting hearing about your kind of career so far and I'm just curious to know what you'd see as your kind of greatest achievement to date oh do you know it's really I, when I heard that you were going to ask me this question I really did kind of have to dig deep and I'm probably going to sound a bit corny when I say this but I think I've had lots of moments in my life where I've gone, I'm really proud of that. You know, I, I was the first um, in my family to get a degree and we were from a very impoverished background. So it was a huge thing. So there's lots of been lots of moments. But I think the biggest thing for me is that I've managed to live a life standing by my values, my sustainable values. Um, and because I think what happens is over the years, you test it, you test it over and over again, whether that's you tested in the fact that, you know, the job that has the greater income, but you sacrifice lifestyle or you sacrifice being able to keep those values and stay true to who you are, whether it's, you know, yeah, the motives, why I'm doing something, you know, the, there was a lot of work in that 10 year period when I was doing the community work where I just did it for free. Um, I was very blessed that we had an income coming into the family with my husband the work I was doing was having such a massive impact that I didn't want to not do it but I could understand that the community couldn't necessarily afford it so I just I just did it and I was very blessed by that um, and I've just managed the whole of my career to trust in my journey and stand by my principles and as I've got older you learn that people do come around they might you know like I was Oh, I was I remember when I became a vegetarian and literally people would just snigger and point at me in the playground I was just the weirdo and you look back now and you look at the movement of vegetarianism and vegans I'm actually vegan but you look at that now and you think yeah I, I was weird back then but people do come around it, it means that you have to stand strong and stand firm but you do come around so I think my greatest achievement is I've managed to stay true I brought two children up around that as well so we we live a very sustainable life as a family um everything's organic and eco-friendly and and I haven't skipped a beat in from the minute they were born it, it was just what we did as a family um and so yeah so these are my kind of greatest achievements I think um yeah and despite the fact that lots of people who know me who might be tuning in might think I thought it was Dragon's Den it wasn't trust me <laughs> No, it's, and, and that seems to be a theme that's coming through, kind of knowing yourself and sticking to your values. That's something that, yeah. that, that Adele certainly mentioned. 
Um, sustainable business is a, a term that you increasingly hear today. And I know you're, you're advising a lot, a lot of people setting businesses up. What advice do you give to entrepreneurs when it comes to creating a truly sustainable business? Yeah, that's a hard one to truly pinpoint, isn't it? Because I think it depends on largely on the business and the industry they're entering into. But I think if I just go off perhaps some of the things that I would say to um, students or graduates coming through the through the enterprise team and, and through me through my advice, I would sort of like I would talk about knowing their values from the word go from the start and what it is they want to achieve. And I think that you have to be really sure because you've got to keep your eye on that and keep really focused because it's so easy. And that's why one of my greatest achievements was that I stood by it because there are so many bumps in the road that come along when you want to implement those values into your business and you are at every stage tested. So to just know what it is you want to achieve and stand by that is essential. Um, you know, basics, check out your suppliers, um, you know, just because somebody says they are following sustainable principles doesn't mean they are. Um, you need to know everybody that's involved in the supply chain. And I mean, everybody, anybody that's offering a service to you, you need to check them out if that's what you want to. Again, it goes back to your values. If that's what you want to embed in your business, then you need to be sure that everybody that you're working with has those same values and principles as well. Um, so chat with them, pick up the phone, maybe he's asked to visit the practices, especially if it's manufacturing, go down to the factory. I mean, everybody can get an audit and look good on a certain day, but can everybody consistently keep that in place? And, and I think that's essential. Um, and I mean, sustainability is just more than a desire. It's It, it takes true conviction, um, whether that's the price, the extra work that's involved, self-confidence, believing in what you want to do. So you've got to surround yourself with like-minded people. Um, there's some brilliant communities out there that have helped me massively over the years that can support you. And just be prepared in the early days to have to work a little harder and make sure you honour your price and recognise the value in what you're making. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me now as an advisor on, um, and, and going, obviously I see lots of different businesses and I see lots of businesses that don't want to have sustainability as, as a goal, which is fine. And I, we help anybody at the, at the enterprise team. But I think the ones that do come through that want to embed it, I think there's the difficulty a lot of them have is in valuing their service and valuing what they're offering. And really, so we've got a wonderful, I mean, our is amazing. Our, our, um, <coughs> our Barbara Hepburn building and everything that we're doing in there now with some of the talent that is coming out of there, the textile talent and creativity. But but the reality is, is that they're not necessarily, when it starts to put a price out to the world of what their products are, they, they doubt themselves, even though everything about them is recycled fabric and they've made it all by hand and it's stunning, then it comes to the price and then they doubt themselves. And then so what happens then is there's that inconsistency because it's also about you valuing yourself um, on the journey as well. So those are the kind of the main things I probably would say. Thank you. And and just um, same question to you that I asked Adana uh, at, at the end of, of my conversation with her is, if, is there one person in particular that's in, inspired you during the course of your career to date and, and what did you learn from them? Do you know, it's, it, 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 that is such an amazing question and it did stump me, I'm not going to lie. Um, because I think it's ordinary people honouring themselves and their values that really, truly inspire me. I think that it's a tough journey standing by what you believe in. And, and society might not always support you. And you meet communities along the way of people that are standing by their sustainable goals. And it's joyous and it spurs you on to continue. And I, I just think every step of my journey, I've met people who are critical in that moment. And they become a beacon of light for me to then take my life on and continue to believe in what I, I have, I'm doing and my path that I'm following. So, yeah, but and I don't mean just in my my career. I think my personal life as well. There's been lots of people at critical moments that have come along, just said something very ordinary to me, or told me a story, and I've gone, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep doing this. And I think that's what I get from my students and, and the graduates that I work with and why I do this job, because, 
you know, I have questioned what am I doing this job for? But how have I gone from being an entrepreneur to then advising? It's like so cliche, isn't it? You know, um, mm-hmm. and I think for me, it is about it is about that. It's very much about they say something in a session and it really resonates with me and it makes me so proud of what they're doing and they're standing by their sustainability values and goals and then it spurs me to continue my path um and I think one of the biggest things when I was growing I think one of the biggest communities that ever helped me were a group of uh, parents in a an eco-friendly school that my daughter went to out in the North Yorkshire Moors where we used to live um and they didn't they never used to really say anything but I watched them live this life and this life was so wholesome and so beautiful and the way they brought their children up was so stunning and it just it, it spurred me on um so yeah, it's ordinary people is probably a little bit dull as that sounds <laughs> no it's um I, I think that's very true actually it's, it's a lot of people that have inspired me of just been going back doing their day-to-day lives they've not necessarily yeah. been massively successful or well known um i think i'm going to have to move on to our next um panelist sarah but thank you so much for sharing your story with us so far um i'd like to now um introduce um kirsty kirsty smith has had a career working in international development with a particular focus on creating um society that works for everybody she's currently the chief executive at cbm an organisation that seeks to transform the lives of people with disabilities, as well as the lives of their families and communities in some of the poorest parts of the world. So um, lovely to have you today uh, here today, Kirsty. Um, I know you're talking to us from Uganda, so let's, uh, fingers crossed that the internet connection holds up. And if you end up putting your um, camera off, then uh, people are just gonna have to look at me, but we'll be able to hear you. So um, okay. Okay. Thank, thank you for coming. Um, Kirsty, again, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and the path that you've taken into the work that you're currently doing um, at the moment at CBM. Sure, yeah. I mean, working in international development, there is no clear career path. It's problematic. You can't say to a young person wanting to work in international development, if you do this, this and this, then this will happen. So actually, some of the things that I want to say today are really about how you seize every opportunity that becomes available to you, but also how you create those opportunities. So I, like Sarah, I was clear that I didn't want to go on a graduate scheme after university. And all my friends were very keen to join the milk round to go and work for, you know, Price Waterhouse and so on. I was just clear that I wanted to go to Africa. It was not that long after Live Aid, so that was still very fresh in my mind. Um, And so I was very fortunate that I got a job with VSO, which is actually how many people in the development sector start their careers. And I had the very good fortune to end up in the middle of nowhere. So I worked at a school in rural Zimbabwe where there was no electricity, no running water, and surrounded by Zimbabwean teachers and children who came to school, walked probably for an hour, hour and a half to get to school with no shoes, with no lunch, and still managed to get nine O levels. Um, You know, really inspiring community members who owned nothing and still wanted to share it with me. Um, And from there, you know, I came back after three years of working in this school, being the head of English, having done, you know, helped that supported this incredible uh, head teacher, got back to the UK and was almost unemployable because none of the UK employers thought that I had done or achieved anything while all the people I had left behind in the UK had been moving forward in their careers. And so I moved actually into fundraising. And that can be a really useful and helpful way into uh, charitable work. And I worked for a number of charities, but finally ended up. Um, back at VSO, working in the head office and doing community development. So education for people in the UK about what is it that makes and keeps places like Africa poor. Um, And I moved on then to do a master's, which is also very common for people working in international development, in participatory community development and how you find a voice for people who are traditionally voiceless. And then I used that for, to build a career, lived and worked in India among Dalit communities and traveled in many African and Asian countries doing community development and facilitating training for, with local partners. Um, and eventually became the chief exec of an organizational development agency, which really tried to be a catalyst for change for local organizations that had inspiring leaders, but perhaps couldn't quite access funding because they didn't necessarily have the right governance structures or HR or finance systems. So providing them with support that enabled them to make that direct connection with funders to raise their profile and so on. 
And that um, very, very grassroots belief in local empowerment and local development led me eventually to CBM, where I extended that uh, desire to really work with the grassroots to actually moving to a group that I hadn't even really been aware of. And that was people living with and at risk of disabilities in the world's poorest countries who they're not even at the back of the queue. They're not in the queue. You know, very often they are so excluded from most emergency and development initiatives. People are, they are not featured at all. And so therefore their needs are not accommodated for, their voices are not heard, and they are excluded from most mainstream international development. And so that's part of CBM's remit is to really make sure that people who are living at risk of disabilities uh, are prevented from developing those impairments that lead to disabilities. People who have disabilities get access to the treatment and the rehabilita rehabilitation that they need. And where possible to reduce the stigma that still surrounds disability in many of the countries where CBM works. Thank you. It's really, really interesting. And, and I recognise what you say about people with disabilities being particularly kind of hidden, literally sometimes in, in kind of communities uh, in many countries around the world still. Um, in terms of um, what you're working on at the moment, I know you're kind of on sabbatical in Uganda, but is there, is there anything that you'd like to kind of highlight in particular um, in terms of what you've been doing recently and why you see it's particularly important when it comes to kind of sustainability? Yeah, so as I say, um, CBM really is trying to change the systems that make and keep people with disabilities poor. Because very often, if you have a disability, you are more likely to become more poor. And if you are more poor, you may face more risky work situations, for example, that can lead to disability. So we see a bit of a vicious cycle there. And CBM really is trying to work with local organizations, with disabled people's organizations very often to try and break that cycle. Um, and I'm working with local partners in Uganda on a variety of initiatives during this sabbatical. But one of the things that I'm actually trying to do is to research how localization works for local partners, by which I mean a transfer of power, resources, decision-making, which is at the moment very much held by agencies in the North. And there is a very strong move for those to be passed to Southern partners. But I want to hear from Ugandan partners, how does it actually feel to be localized? You know, are they, do they have the systems that they need in order to access funding directly? Um, are they happy with that? Or do they actually think that there are different roles that agencies can play? Because certainly in international development, things are changing very fast. And um, CBM wants to make sure that we are not taking over the role of our Southern partners, but that we are really fulfilling the most useful things that we can do. Um, and lastly, I would say that probably one of the strongest messages um, that CBM has really enforced, reinforced within me is the need not to speak for others. There is a mantra in the disability sector, which is nothing about us without us. And so I don't claim to speak for people with disabilities. I am there alongside them. I am their ally and I will support them to make the connections that they need, but they are the ones who know their situation best. They are the ones who are best able to identify the long-term solutions that will actually give them sustainable change in their own context. And therefore they are the ones who must have their say and who must make decisions about their futures. That's, and I really recognize that. And I know that the work that, um... Huddersfield has done in its research projects in Southwest Ethiopia is very much about empowering local people and putting them in control of their institutions and, and, and enabling them to run that themselves and support them in the doing of it. Um, in terms of, uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned, you touched on how you got into working for a charity via VSO, which was, is, I really, I really recognise that as a common thread. What advice would you give to someone wanting a career working for a charity such as yours today? Um, well, the first thing I would say is be recognise that even people who are interns in international development will very often have a master's and have overseas experience. So don't assume that you will be able to move into this sector without having taken opportunities, even if it's in your university holidays, really, really seize any opportunity that presents itself to you. So if you're going traveling and you have the opportunity to do some work, as long as it is not what I would call volunteerism, we are not recommending that people go and spend two weeks in an orphanage and then all the children who then become attached to you are completely dumbfounded when you suddenly disappear. 
Um, however, I would really strongly recommend that if people are taking a year out, for example, after they finish their degree, to really try and find somewhere to be based for four, five, six, 12 months, because you will grow so much in that uh, situation, but you will also come back very much better equipped and you will understand much better the contexts that many of the international development situations that we have to deal with and which we are challenged by, how they actually are in reality in the field. So seize every opportunity, avoid volunteerism, um, learn from other people and really be willing to do anything. So if you join an organization or if you volunteer at an organization, which is also a great thing to do in the UK, be willing to do the filing if that's what they need. They're not going to give you a really high powered research project in your first few weeks. But actually, all you need to do is demonstrate your aptitude and a great attitude and you will be able to progress. Thanks. I think that's really, really great advice. Um, it's uh, the organisation I work for, we we don't have a, an intern scheme at the moment, but we're looking at how we might actually manage to pay people as well to do things like that, because it's otherwise it's it, it can really exclude other part, uh, some people who aren't then able to afford to do it. But um, yeah, and volunteering in your local community is another great way of doing it. Um, just before we kind of move on, I just I was curious to know, but who's inspired you during the course of your career? And and again, what did you learn from them? There's so many people. I don't know. The answer is such a difficult question. I mean, actually, like Sarah, and my parents, and, and, and like Adele, actually, my parents didn't go to university. Um, they both left school at 15. And yet they have been the most strong advocates of recycling, of being eco-friendly, of understanding the context in which I have found myself throughout my career. They are absolutely my heroes. You know, and they're now in their 80s and they're still absolutely, have you seen this? Have you tried this? Have you, have you swapped your laundry detergent? Um, you know, so I can't get away with anything now uh, from these incredible individuals. And then, you know, at the other end, my children. Um, and, you know, children help you to keep a balance in your career because international development can be very demanding. You may have to spend quite long times away from home, um, but their creativity and their sense of adventure and their boldness their willing to, willingness to say, look, let's just do it and we'll apologise later. Um, you know, and, and, and with my husband, just their, their capacity to keep me grounded, to make me laugh, even when actually I'm facing really challenging situations at work and sometimes actually quite distressing situations in the field projects where we work. Um, I'm also very fortunate that when I travel, I am inspired by the community of members that I meet, the, the resilience that people show, people having to crawl through their own faeces for lack of a wheelchair because they have a pit latrine or people who are having to decide in the morning whether they feed their daughter or their son or whether they buy breakfast or whether they buy soap for the school uniforms that they need to keep clean for their children you know these are people who are making life changing decisions every day that i never have to make and they are just so inspiring and i have been very lucky you know in zimbabwe i had this head teacher who taught me humility and compassion and then when I lived in India, I had this four foot nothing traditional birth attendant who looked after me in the village and she was so sassy. You know, she's had two years of schooling and yet she still had all of us under her control just by sheer willpower and persistence and courage, actually. And then lastly, I work in a sector which encourages people to be great, actually. And I, I have a fantastic team now and I have been able to build fantastic teams and have therefore been surrounded. This is the, the great tip, actually, if you're a CEO, surround yourself with people more brilliant than yourself. And then that actually helps the organization to soar. Uh, so for my, my team and my peers in the sector. No, and uh, yeah, I always was, I was think, yeah, absolutely. Hire good people, they make your life a lot easier. So definitely a great lesson. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned your kind of children and Adan mentioned her kind of strong sense of justice and her, as, of her son and, and kind of learning from, there's lots of people out there who can inspire us out, us out there and, and young people in particular. Um, and I would guess a lot of those students out there who may be listening to us, um, also kind of sustainability is particularly important for them. And they're going to be inheriting this kind of climate uh, damaged world at the moment. Um, I, thank you, Kirsty. Um, really interesting and I know you're going to join us later. Um, I'm going to move on now to um, Catherine. Kat, Kat Lampen um, she's currently um, a partner at Deloitte and has 
20 years experience of developing business strategies in response to sustainability issues. And during this time, she's advised FTSE 100 company boards on everything from decarbonisation to responding to human rights violations in supply chain. So, Kat, thank you for joining us today. Um, just again, start by asking that first question, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and the path that took you into the work that you're currently doing at the moment with Deloitte. Thank you and, and good to see everyone today. Um, so this, like everyone else on, on the call, um, started very early for me. It's always been a, a passion since I was a kid. Um, I think it, it really started when um, I, I grew up in Cornwall and there was a, a local wildlife reserve, which some um, thugs put a can of oil in um, and I could see all of the, the frogs dying and the frogs spawn. Um, and so I decided that I was going to go on my first mission to save the world, which was um, taking all of the frog spawn um, home with me in, in buckets and then hiding it under my bed. Um, and I did some research to find out that you could feed cat food to um, to um, um, young frogs before they can, can walk. And then one day I came home from school and there were thousands of frogs appearing from my, my bedroom. So it really started back then. Um, and, I, you know, when I um, decided to do my A-levels, I, I picked sciences and, and geography, uh, like I think many others. Um, and I guess the, the bit that crystallised my focus on the kind of corporate sector was um, during the, the Rio summit in, in 92. So there were two aspects to that. So one, it was the first time that I felt that we'd really spoken seriously about climate change and the impact that it has. Um, but also um, there was this picture taken at the end of the summit of everyone that was involved. And there were there was like one or two women out of about 100. Um, so I thought, no, this is this is somewhere where there needs to be more women representatives um, um, on this type of topic. So I decided to do environmental economics as my degree. Um, and I, then I did a master's in international environmental policy, um, which was around the time of the Kyoto um, Protocol. So, so again, quite timely. And I knew I wanted to go into sustainability, but there weren't many careers that were focused on that area back then, and particularly not for kind of new graduates out of university. So I've got to say it was a hard slog between um, me getting my uh, my master's degree and then then getting the first job. And, and again, like like others, you know, that, that kind of first slog, <laughs> Um, was really important. I had to do quite a lot of work for free. Um, and so I was in the day I was, I was working for an organisation called Accountability, um, which helped companies around um, how transparent they were and their supply chains and also um, you know, things like board governance. So I worked there for about a year. Um, but in the evenings, I was um, living at a student hall still and I was uh, managing health and safety which as you might know for student halls back in the day was quite a dangerous experience um, so I was first on the scene for all the broken bones and um, sick people so I had multiple jobs in the first couple of years um, I, I guess the other thing was you know as you kind of finish university um, there were loads of graduate positions that I could have taken and I remember applying for the HSBC um, intake and I was all of a sudden in a room full of 50 people and trying to demonstrate how I could work in a team um, so that, that really wasn't uh, the route that I wanted to go down um, and also the the entry tests I would have definitely failed the maths one so I did have to find a different way in and, and that that was getting that experience so I worked for accountability for free I worked in the student halls, I worked in the, the local bar, um, and, and then I um, got a little, little bit lucky, I guess. Um, there was um, an article in the Financial Times on sustainability and the best companies around it, and I contacted them, and they said, why don't you come and work for us for a bit? So I worked for the Financial Times um, part-time, where my, my role was really to go and interview chief executives on climate change. But really, my role was to educate them on what climate change was at that point. So, so it was a, an interesting job with a lot of creative writing back in the day. So then I decided I really wanted to work like in-house at a big corporate. So I worked for, a, for one of the banks um, and set up their sustainability programme in South America and, um, 
and the Middle East um, and Central Europe. And that was super exciting because it really was the first time that I was able to apply some of the things that I'd learned to, to real life. And, you know, you, you realise that, you know, some of the things that, that you learn at university when you try and apply it in the real world situation are much more complicated. And I remember one of those things was around human rights. Um, so when I turned up in, in Mexico, I had um, kids um, building the, the top two floors of um, the, build, the, the new office that we were moving into. And seeing kind of the impact of what you do when you, you take those children out of that, that workplace and the impact on their families and, and what they will do to, to, to get money really kind of opened my eyes to the, the fact that, you know, big corporates need to take responsibility for how they're managing some of this. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. So I was head of sustainability there and I, I really actually missed London. So um, I um, decided to apply for the big consulting firms um, and Deloitte was one of them. And I didn't need to do a math test to get in as well. So it was even better. Um, so I joined Deloitte 15 years ago. Um, and that was when we set up our sustainability practice. Um, and um, since then, you know, I've, I guess, progressed through the different grades that we have. Um, and I've done a lot of things, you know, that have um, been super exciting, you know, everything from working with mining companies that, that really have big problems that they need to solve. Um, and, you know, I've seen some of the most horrific pollution that you, you'd ever imagine in the sea um, and you know, sides of mines collapsing because the permafrost is melting um and um and I think one of the things that I realized kind of probably midway through my career that a, a lot of the um power in, in this space comes from the big banks and investors and what they want to do in this space so I've started focusing on sustainable finance specifically um earlier in my career and um work with a lot of the big banks at the moment in terms of um you know what they should be financing how do they divest from things like thermal coal um and so so i do that now for our europe and middle east firm so i i, I run that that part of our global practice um so we have three hundred and thirty thousand people globally um and probably about four thousand of those are sustainability specialists and um the other area is obviously the broader sustainability piece. So, um, so we have a big team advising on everything from, you know, the, what the government should be doing around COP26, right through to um, the Earthshot Prize, which is like the, the Nobel Peace Prize for the environment, which we're, we're the implementation partner on. So some super exciting things. Um, and, and as part of that, I lead our UK sustainability practice as well. That sounds like quite a remit. So, um... yeah. <laughs> it must keep you very, very busy. Oh, yeah. um, really interesting to hear, you know, the journey into where you got to and, and that, that kind of, you know, working for free, it seems to be kind of a bit of a theme along the way here, um, but not necessarily one that uh, is, is, is a good one. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, you know, you, you've, you've made it to, to partner and in a typically male dominated environment, I was particularly struck by you, you saying that the, the kind of, you know, the people at the Rio summit and, mm. and what have you. Um, was that always a goal of yours and, and how did you achieve it? Yeah, um, I mean, it, I would say it, it wasn't always a goal. Um, when I joined Deloitte, I wanted to get to senior manager, which is probably midway to, to partner. And um, you know, that was going to be my dream life and I'd have two Cocker Spaniels live in the countryside and the, the latter of those haven't happened. Um, but what I did realise is, um, you know, it was, a, it was a good company to work for. Um, and, and like you say, it's very male dominated um, at, at the top of the organisation. Um, and I lead talent as part of another one of my hats. And I guess in, in that role, I've really seen a difference between how um, women and men approach their promotion processes, um, which has been a bit of an eye opener because I didn't realize that before I was in this role. And that really kind of stems around, you know, that, that kind of forward looking planning. Um, so every single one of them every year will have a set of objectives that they know how they're going to get to the next level. And I think um, like a lot of women don't really 
um, kind of shout out as much as they should about what they want in the future. So, it, you know, it, I found that quite difficult in my earlier career. But once I realised that actually I just have the same rights as everyone else to be at the top of the company um, and it hasn't really been a, a barrier since then, to be honest. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, everyone has opportunity to progress um, and yeah, don't, don't feel like you can ask for things that might feel a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and is there anybody in particular who's inspired you during the course of your career? And, and again, what did you learn from them? Yeah, so I mean, I think that I mean, there's many people that have inspired me. Um, people that I've worked closely with, um, people that are kind of junior working for me. Um, but I think in terms of well-known people, um, so obviously, uh, David Attenborough is. I'm a massive fan of David Attenborough, um, and I worked I worked with him on the um, climate change the facts documentary um, a couple of years ago, and he's just su such an inspirational person. Um, I don't know what we're going to do uh, once he goes. Yeah. We, we need a replacement um, as good. Um, so, so I think there's something about bringing this into into real lives, into people's living rooms, and I think you know that's what that you know BBC series has done. Um, similarly, from a business perspective, um, there's a journalist called Gillian Tett who works um, for the Financial Times, and she she produces a column called um, Moral Money. Um, and we've seen a massive increase in interest in this area since it's been covered in a, in a comprehensive way by the FT. It, you know, it's, it's really made a big impact. So, so I think um, she really struggled to get the FT to agree to, to do that as a column. And now it's their most popular um, section of the, the paper. So that, that was, um, I think she's very inspirational from that perspective. And then um, I do like my handbag. So um, Anya Hinmarsh, um, who's a, a designer, but she um, created a bag uh, probably about 20 years ago called I, called I Am Not A Plastic Bag. Yes. And that was, that was very, uh, I, I loved that at the time. And she's continued on, on that route and inspired many other kind of fashion designers to go down that route. Right, thank you for that. Um, we've, we've slightly overrun, so if, if you don't mind, um, I'm going to bring us all together now so that we can deal with everybody else's kind of questions. Um, we've got, I think we're going to put everybody um, back on the screen together. Um, and uh, we've got some questions um, coming through from the audience. I think we've got a mixture of kind of um, university staff, non-university staff, students um, out there. So um, we're going to kind of move on to having a few questions about um uh, that come through here um we've we've talked about kind of who's inspired us and we've had some um some great examples from kind of tony morrison and david attenborough just kind of everyday people that we've all met or kind of family members um i was just um wondering from all of you really in terms of as women in sustainability what barriers you've faced throughout your career and and how did you overcome them? And maybe if I can actually start with you, Kat, first on that one, um, and if that's something yeah. that you've got. Um, so I think the, the biggest barrier that I had was actually around um, confidence uh, when I was in a, a heavily male environment, particularly with senior male um, partners. Um, so. I, um, I actually did something quite interesting to, to address that as a challenge. I had hypnotism um, about um, how, you, how you think of things differently. So when you feel fear, it's the same feeling that is when you are on a roller coaster and you feel excited. So basically I had hypnotism to swap the two around and it had a magical impact on me. And so now they can't shut me up. Um, but no, it was, it was really around getting confidence and, and that kind of working out where there were barriers and where I needed to do more work around stakeholder management um, was, was really important. Thank you. I love that. You'll have to give us the name of your hypnotist and we'll get it put in the chat and uh, I'll be signing up as well, I think. Um, Adele, can I ask you the same question in terms of you know, barriers that you've faced? Yeah, I mean, I, I have faced a lot of barriers. I've faced barriers 
as a, as a black woman, particularly in academia, there is a there, there is a lot of racism in academia, as you will all be aware of. Um, but I think in terms of what Kat just said, being I found myself in meetings and in settings where I was often the only woman, especially as a professor at that level, and I was almost certainly going to be the only black woman. And there were times when you think like, and of course, like, I mean, I'm, I'm quite assertive, but that hasn't always been the way. I've had to work to get there and getting there, what strategies do you use to get there? There'd be times when you would be in a gathering and you'd think, I can't, I cannot say anything. Or you would say something and it would just be completely dismissed. And then somebody would say exactly what you had just said. And everybody would say, well, that's a fantastic idea. And I, 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 I learned to do something. Now this is gonna offend some people and I'm really apologizing in advance. But I imagine this group of guys were all kind of basically comparing penises and I imagined that I had a huge penis in my handbag and I would stick it on the middle of the table and I would say, okay, mine's bigger than a lot of yours, now let's talk. And I used to have that in my head and it would make me giggle, very inappropriate. But you giggle in a meeting where people are being really serious and, mm -hmm. and they look at you and you use that opportunity to interject. So it was kind of a mental vision that I had that kind of gave me a bit of confidence and this is all they're doing. They're only seeing how far they can pee or whatever, right in the snow, whatever. That's all they're doing. So don't be scared of it. Just go for it. I love that hypnotism and, and also uh, imagining, uh, you yeah, know, coming up with creative, uh, creative ways of seeing others. And Kirsty, can I ask you the same question? Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate that I work in a sector where actually it's reasonably well balanced and there are lots of women in senior positions and it's very equal ops and all jobs are you know, equal pay, whether you're a man or a woman. Um, so I, I recognise that I am very fortunate and I personally have been able to and many of my more junior female colleagues have been able to progress very successfully, which doesn't mean, of course, that we don't have many of the issues that all women face in the workplace that you know, we tend to not go for a job if we don't think we're 100% qualified for it. Whereas I think a man would go for it if they think they've got 50% of the qualifications. They, you know, and, and men, I know, it's uh, many, many studies have shown that men are actually employed for their aptitude, uh, for their, their potential. Whereas women tend to be employed for uh, the, their track record, their experience. So there is inbuilt sexism in recruitment. Um, but I am very fortunate that I haven't myself experienced it that often. Although I have had the experience that Adele mentioned, and I have also been in a room where I've taken a junior colleague who was a tall man, where everybody in the room spent the entire meeting talking to him. <laughs> and both he and I were going, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, so, yeah. Um, the, the last thing I would probably say is that, you know, even if the old boys network is reduced from what it used to be, it's still alive and well. And there is not really an old boys network for women. However, I would say relationship building is still hugely important and you need to invest in that. You need to recognize that how you do things and how you talk to people and how you behave is as important as what you achieve and what you output. And that therefore building those relationships will often help you in your career in developing further. That's really great advice. Thank you, Kirsty. And, and finally, Sarah, from you, what anything else that you'd like to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, I think that it was, I, I tend to avoid talking about this in my early kind of first five years in business because it's so negative and I'm not a negative person. But actually, I got death threats. I got women hating me because they were unsure of what I was doing and why I was, who did I think I was. I got men hating on me because I was trying to kind of make it in a world which was very male dominated. It was, it was horrible. I actually got easy when I got married, would you believe? And then it felt like the conversation went through him. And so it got easier to run my business. Um, it was it was terrible. It was it was awful. I should have now. And I'm so pleased we've come so far now. And I think for me, I went on a, a journey with myself. And, and that was my key. Um, although I, I do like Adele's um, <laughs> technique. I think maybe I should have talked to Adele earlier in my life. But mm. I just kind of went on a journey with myself. And I had to just tell myself that I was staying true to what I believed in. I know that that's why I touched on it when I was chatting. I know that people are very unsure when something very new and groundbreaking comes through. 
and it's very easy when you see that somebody having such success to to hit on someone but I just had to stay true to who I was and I worked on myself the whole time really and I've, I've tried hypnotism actually it is very good but I've also done other things as well along the way yoga helps me lots keeps me grounded takes me back meditation all those things that make me then go out the next day fresh as a daisy ready to face the world again yeah absolutely thanks that's quite a selection there I think I've got I've got a question here which is is specifically for, for you Adele it was I think it comes from something that you'd said early on one was it, it's around um if um 40 percent of domestic violence is towards men I think you must have said 60 was aimed at women um wouldn't it be better to go off a case by case approach rather than the solely gender based one? Sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, they, they seem to be saying that, that that there's also domestic violence against men, um, sure, sure. And, and they've got a figure of forty percent here. And wouldn't therefore be better to rather than take a gender based approach? I think they're assuming that gender is is they're, they're making the assumption that gender is about female rather than gender being about obviously men and women um yeah okay i get it i i it's a very very important question and actually uh, the work we did in the caribbean when people use the phrase gender-based violence i use that phrase because that's recognized within the international language but there is an assumption that we're completely ignoring male victimization there is an assumption that we're not considering trans rights that we're not considering the whole range of issues that we're only focusing on women. We do primarily focus on women in our work, but we do not neglect male victimization. For us, um, any form of, of violence within, re within relationships is something that we need to tackle. We tackle violence against women because it is the most, it is the, pre the, the, the prevalence of violence against women is so much greater the, uh, the impacts of different kinds of violence, men are less likely to experience rape, for example, the different kinds of violence. There isn't a level of equality around the scale of violence or the types of violence, but you cannot minimize male victimization. And in fact, one of the crucial things that we discovered from our early research in the Caribbean, we found when we did a survey of, uh, of boys' experiences of violence, that they were exposed to far greater of levels of violence as boys than were the girls that we surveyed and that that actually then fed into attitudes around the normalization of violence and if and but but yet nobody was attending to their needs nobody was ever thinking about male victimization we certainly do we certainly do but we also know that we've got to start with changing attitudes among not just males but also among females. And we also found that, of course, women can be complicit in violence against men. We know that. So when we use the term gender-based violence, I would just say that we are using, we, I'm very mindful that for the hearer, that doesn't sound balanced, but actually it can be. Yeah, I think, no, that's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you for dealing with that. Um, I've, I've got a question here um, to Sarah. A um, bit of a change of topic. How do you encourage business owners to balance the motive for profit and business expansion and selling more stuff or cushions or whatever it may be with um, the attend with all the associated uh, environmental impacts attendant on that, whilst balancing a drive towards sustainability? So I suppose the assumption here is that profit and sustainability don't aren't the same thing. But interested in your view on that? Yeah, it is a tough one because I think that. Um, and I mean, I've gone wrong. I mean, you know, you only need to check my history. I've, I've got 25 years. I've done a lot of businesses. I've gone wrong. I've taken long turns and I've tried to readdress that. I think it's about choose your battles, isn't it? It's about working out in the business what really needs to be the core, what are your core values and what you want to stand by and then aiming for that. In terms of the balance and the profit, I think that there are plenty of model businesses out there that are managing to do both. I do think it's tricky. And I do think you have to be creative. You have to be very, like I said, you have to, from the outset, you have to um, underpin, but you've got, you've got to say what your values are, you've got to stick to them and underpin the business around those. And then from there, I think other things come. Do you know, I've got a really, I, I know it sounds quite kind of new age, but I think you have to trust on in the journey as well. There are plenty of businesses out there that are not compromising. And I've compromised. I'm, I'm you know, I'm not sitting here saying I've run a, I've led a good life my whole life 
I've made some wrong turns, but I think that it is possible. And I think maybe that my eyes were opened over the last, certainly in the last five years, as it's become more, um, as it's become, as it's become part of an agenda, I think you can very much balance the two. It's just about setting the intention and making sure you build the business model around that. Um, and again, if you're a student or graduate, you can come and see us and we can help you build the business model around that because it is possible. Some brilliant businesses out there not compromising at the moment and won't yeah. need to. And I think, Kat, I'd, I'd be interested to know your view on that, working for a big corporate and, and advising a lot of other companies in terms of, is it that, you know, is it always an either or? Is it sustainability or profit or can you see them coming together? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely coming together. We, we've just done a piece of research on the consumer demand for sustainable products and it's, it's gone through the roof during COVID, which is quite interesting where people have maybe had less money to, to spend. Um, I, I think the, the kind of more visible connectedness between nature and, you know, what, what arrives through your post box is, is, is really kind of um, making people rethink how they buy, you know, whether it's locally sourced, what materials are um, being used and the more that we get kind of coverage on you know, the TV, on all of the social media sites or on some of these topics, the, the more that we're seeing change. So from a consumer perspective, it's definitely increasing. I think the, where the big challenge lies is on the big, heavy um, industries like oil and gas, um, mining. They're not moving fast enough at the moment. Um, and, you know, all of them have set net zero targets but that's meaningless unless they have a plan to get there. So there needs to be a lot of kind of technology um, innovation over the next year or so in order to, to meet the targets that we've set in the UK and globally. Great, thank you. Um, I've got, a conscious that our audience is a lot of people who work in education um, in it, and we've had a couple of questions over the theme of education and what we should teach in schools and colleges to enable um, you know conversations among young people and I suppose that's sustainability more widely whether it's about inclusion or um, you know kind of um, gender equality uh, as well as kind of environmental sustainability and um, uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask you Adele first instance in terms of you're still are you, I don't know if you're still teaching or not but um, have you any thoughts about that? Well what we do in our, our centre we use the research to create pro-social video games and educational tools to use in schools. I mean, we, we, uh, we understand, we believe very strongly that educating children, helping children to have a kind of an immersive experience through pro-social video games can actually begin to challenge and change some of the attitudes and norms that fuel gender-based violence. I mean, when we think about violence against women and girls, that is set within a context of gender inequality which is kind of different to violence against boys and men. It's not that that violence is less important, but those are quite different contexts. And so we can, through education, we can, we can begin to generate uh, a, greater, a greater understanding of the importance of gender equality and what the individual's role is in terms of reflecting on their own behaviors and how they grow as a person. And we can start that with kids. And that's exactly what we do. So we are doing it, we are providing interventions in developing curriculum materials out of our research that is currently, in fact, as I speak, we are having trials at the moment in Uganda of a wonderful game that we created around child marriage and sexual coercion, which is, uh, which is the focus of the team from Makerere University. And we are now currently trialing our video game, which is set as a, it, it's, it's designed as a classroom tool as an alternative to the chalk and the talk. And it's actually about ch children immersing in a story that is authentic, relevant in their language, is about their people and their issues. And then that changing attitudes and norms. And then we do, the trials will test to what extent have we been able to shift children's attitudes along in terms of gender equality. So education, absolutely, it's the key. That's that's a really great example. Um, and Kirsty, if I could ask the same one to you in terms of um, inclusion and, and issues around disability in terms of um, taking that into the classroom, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, first of all, teachers need to recognise the voices that are not being heard, whether that's girls, whether that's people of colour, whether that's people with disabilities. And if you look at, you know, most books, 
they are from a white male perspective. You know, even, even children's books, the adventure usually happens to a small white boy. Um, and actually, we've got to change the narrative. And the way to do that is to actually get other voices to help us to do that. Um, so, you know, if you, I, you know, preparing a presentation as a lecturer, don't always put a clip art picture that you find first. You know, make, if, if, you, if you get a picture of a, a white fireman, then, you know, look for a black female pilot or look for a person in a wheelchair who is, you know, doing whatever it is. But we, we tend to uh, veer towards what's easy, what's straightforward, what's normative. Um, and we have got to get more voices heard because that's the only way um, to, to enable people who are different to what has traditionally been the norm. Um, and teachers, of course, can absolutely lead the way there. They have the potential to make sure that alternative perspectives are being offered. Thank you. That's, um, that's great advice for everybody. I think something everybody can take, uh, you know, take account of in their kind of working lives. Um, I, I want to ask a question now, um, because I know that we've, we had quite a lot of men sign up to, to, this, um, to this webinar in that how can men be an ally to women in sustainability and in the wider workplace? So um, if I could ask Kat, if I could ask you that one first. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, it's just making sure that wh where you have, I guess, female colleagues or team members that you're giving them the opportunity to speak up. Um, because I think, you know, that that kind of shyness and um, so it can be Im intimidating sometimes. And, and so make sure that everyone has spoken in the room if you're in a meeting or, or doing a project together. I think that would be the one thing I would say, because I think once people do start speaking, it becomes a lot easier um, for them and they feel a lot more accepted. Um, but but we, we see it constantly where people are kind of spoken over and not given that opportunity. So I would say that's the one thing I would recommend. Great, that's a great piece of advice. I'm just conscious that we've got like two minutes left. I've had a last question come in to go to all of you. So you've got 30 seconds each. and. It's if you could go back in time, would you change anything? And looking forward, how important do you think the role of women in achieving sustainable development um, is going to be? So if you could go back in time, would you change anything? Um, Sarah, I'll go to you first. No, I wouldn't, because I think we're all a product of our journey. And it's been some terrible times, but no, I wouldn't change it. Ironically, because I wouldn't be who I am sat here now if I'd not gone through all that. That's a really a good, quick answer there. Um, Kirsty, you're next. Uh, I would say when I have made difficult decisions, I have made them too slowly. So I would say when it's difficult and it's, it, it, it's painful, just do it. And actually don't prolong the agony for everybody involved. Do it. So act more boldly, I would say. Okay, great. Um, Kat, I'll go to you next. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm a creation of the, the good and bad decisions I've made. And so, I, you know, I don't think that I would change anything. I, I might be a bit more confident in my viewpoint, um, like, like Kirsty just, just mentioned. I think, you know, you, this is such an important area and we need people to be really confident in speaking out about it and believing in it um, in the way that we do. So that would be mine. Great, thank you. And I'm, Adele, I'm going to give the final word to you. Uh, well, I kind of um, agree very much with Kirsty. I, I've witnessed a lot of, I, I believe I also have been a bystander to, to things that have been wrong. And I don't think I have often spoken up boldly enough or quickly enough. And I was probably scared, but there's actually nothing to be fearful of. I would you know, especially in academia, I've seen examples of academic bullying and I was too, too slow to spot it and too slow to deal with it. So don't be, don't be a bystander person who witnesses something and does nothing. Always do something, say something, be bold, go brave. Yeah. Oh, that's a great way to finish. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I can't believe this is close I could say really quickly. So I hope it has for the audience as well. Um, just like to thank um, Adele and Sarah, Kirsty and Kat for their time and for sharing their you know, very personal stories with us. 
Um, it's been a real privilege to kind of both be part of this panel and to, to listen to you all. Um, and also thanks to our audience for making time to attend and, and for your questions and your interest. I know that um, University of Huddersfield is hoping this is going to be a first and they're going to keep doing this as a women's sustainability session. So I hope we've inspired all of you to think about how you can create more sustainable a more sustainable and equitable world. Um, whether that's through a career that you're about to start or one that you're um, currently in the middle of. But um, thanks a lot, everybody. And I'll let you all get on with your day. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. Thanks, everybody. Bye.